Hello everyone and welcome to Amman Foreign Company. Here's what's coming up. Two dead as racial unrest in Wisconsin grows after police shoot yet another black man, Jacob Blake. I talk to Jay Johnson, President Obama's Secretary of Homeland Security. Then, amid record-breaking wildfires and hurricanes approaching, young conservative environmentalist Benji Backer talks about why climate is AWOL again at the Republican National Convention. Plus, around the world, domestic abuse spiked under coronavirus lockdowns. I talked to survivor Joshina Michelle about her movement to empower women. And I'm not going to follow at all costs just because the person says that they're a Republican and they are the president of the United States. Our Michelle Martin talks to former GOP Congresswoman Mia Love about the success and failures of the Trump administration. Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz, and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London. And the tension is rising as President Trump says that he is sending in federal law enforcement to quell unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This follows the shooting of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, by police. The president tweeted, we will not stand for looting, violence, arson, and lawlessness on American streets. Now, events there are quickly turning into a political flashpoint in one of the nation's most important swing states. Jacob Blake's family says it'll take a miracle for him to walk again after police shot him seven times in the back. In the aftermath, two people have been killed, allegedly by a member of what's been described as a vigilante militia, which claims to be protecting property from protesters. An investigation is underway to determine exactly what happened and an arrest has been made. All of this as Republican convention unfolds amid two different messages. First Lady Melania Trump made a plea for racial harmony while the president's son has raised the dark specter of mob violence, fear and destruction. With me to discuss the racial, security and political ramifications is Jay Johnson, President Obama's Secretary of Homeland Security. Secretary Johnson, welcome to the program. Uh, the latest information from me. Wisconsin is, is that officials have made an arrest. It's allegedly a teenage boy coming from out of state, not so far away, but from out of state uh, in Antioch, Illinois, and he's been charged with homicide in the first degree, intentional homicide. This is over the shootings overnight that's caused so much drama now there. What do you make, first and foremost, of, of who this kind of vigilante militia, as it's been described, is? What is happening there, unfolding in front of our eyes now? I think that there are numerous elements of what is happening in, in Wisconsin. One, you have people who are rightly upset at what seems to be the endless stream of use of excessive force by our nation's law enforcement against members of the African-American community who are on the streets protesting peacefully, uh, as I did in June after George Floyd was killed here in Montclair, New Jersey. I guess that makes me a protester. I was on the streets. I marched peaceably. There are a number of people on the streets doing exactly that. You have another category of people, frankly, who are concerned, who are upset, and can be provoked into something by an unnecessarily antagonistic law enforcement presence in the situation. There's opportunistic looting by people who don't even know the name, Jacob Blake or George Floyd. And then you have, and this is what troubles me about Wisconsin now, uh, apparently, the presence of, of, of groups or individuals of some type of self-proclaimed militia which cannot be there for any good purpose, certainly not at the request of local authorities who are adding to the danger 
of this situation, as your as your uh, your your broadcast just a second ago indicates. So let's just remind everybody what happened on Sunday night. There is video. Um, it didn't go as viral as what happened to George Floyd. Uh, Jacob Blake is still alive, but his parents, his family are saying, you know, he's fighting for his life. It'll take a miracle if he's not permanently paralyzed. Let us show the video of what happened uh, on Sunday, where it's clear that there's some kind of altercation around the back of a car. <clears throat> Allegedly, some of his young children are in the car. And then he's seen to be walking around uh, again to, to the door of the car, trying to get into the car. Uh, there are policemen behind him, and you hear these shots, and, and then we know what happened. Um, so this is the video that I'm talking about. Um, I, I, I want to know, I guess I want to know from you, first of all, there's been no, uh, you know, reaction from the police. We don't know what's happened or what will happen to the policeman uh, in question. And we don't know, certainly the, the, the family says they haven't had a full explanation of, of, of everything. So... How, especially now, does this keep happening? Is I guess what I want to ask you. I believe that the, the cry, the grievance that we hear so much in this country and beyond this country, Black Lives Matter, is legitimate. Over and over and over again, we see our nation's law enforcement engaging in acts of uh, excessive force, homicide, carried out against people with black skin, treating them as if they are animals and the cop is, is the hunter. We don't know all the facts about what happened in Wisconsin, but from the video and from the circumstances we do know, it is extremely hard for me to justify why a nation's, a member of nation's law enforcement would shoot an unarmed man in the back seven times in front of his children. I believe the larger problem we have here is our local police, our nation's law enforcement, are not sufficiently trained in tactics of de-escalation, to de-escalate a tense situation like this so that you don't end up with tragic results like this. I just want to uh, read you something that a uh, White House correspondent for PBS tweeted. It's in response to the shooting of Jacob Blake and about his family. She said, Jacob Blake's family said for years that they've watched as police shot and killed black people on video, and now they're living part of that nightmare. That's at the heart of being black in America, living with that terrible anticipation of death. That's the trauma in our bones. How, how does that resonate with you, Secretary Johnson? Well, I've been a, I've been a black man in, in this country for almost 63 years, so of course it resonates with me. And uh, it resonates with members of my family. It's a conversation that I've had to have with my own children about uh, living in this society. I think it's, it's important to remember that most of our nation's law enforcement are there to, to serve and protect. Here, for example, in Montclair, New Jersey, when we had our marches after George Floyd's death, the only presence I saw of our local police were those who were protecting the marchers barricading the streets, protecting the marchers. But far, far too many of the members of our nation's law enforcement are engaging in acts of excessive force. Uh, I think there's a recruitment problem with the type of people we're recruiting into police forces in our cities. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, there's a problem with not teaching cops how to de-escalate a situation where somebody falls asleep in the drive-in to a fast food restaurant or over a package of, of cigarettes or over a counterfeit $20 bill, the tactics of de-escalation so that you don't end up with these tragic circumstances. You, you, you mentioned, obviously, what happened in Georgia after George Floyd, what happened to Eric Garner in New York, and, and what happened to George Floyd, those, those three uh, cases that you just mentioned. So now I want to ask you this, because we've seen similar um, anger in, in Portland, and it's been framed very differently by different political uh, parties. <clears throat> uh, you saw the Homeland Security Department, which you used to lead, sent, uh, sent, sent forces there. And now President Trump is saying that he's sending forces, federal assistance, he said, plus the National Guard into Kenosha, into Wisconsin, at the apparent request of the governor there. 
will that de-escalate or will that escalate? And, and, and we know what happened in Portland. I, I just, what is the point of this at this time, do you think? Good question. I'm very worried that uh, sending in a federal presence, a federal force, and telegraphing it, as this president just did, has the effect of unnecessarily uh, antagonizing and amping up and provoking the situation rather than rather than calming it down. That appears to have been the case in Portland. So I would be thinking really hard about whether or not I'm making the situation worse but by doing so. You have to unpack that tweet, by the way. Um, sending in the guard, the National Guard, under the control of the governor, paid for by the federal government, is not that unusual. And so that might be what's going on right here if the governor believes that local law enforcement is not sufficient. My concern, however, is that we are in an election year. Uh, we're in a convention week. And some of this, quite, quite frankly, uh, has the appearance of a of, of, of politics at work here. It's as if it's the 1968 Richard Nixon law and order card being played again, but in very, very different circumstances in 2020. Well, you know, that leads me into the, into the next question. Um, as you know, after George Floyd's uh, killing, uh, there was a huge uh, explosion of, of support for tackling racial injustice uh, across the board. I mean, it was very, very, you know, yes. high. Many people <clears throat> saying it was a big, big election issue for them. But, but it seems to be decreasing now. Um, after George Floyd's death, basically, um, many people said the protests were mostly legitimate in, uh, in June, 62%, but in August, 53%. And those acting unlawfully in June, it was 28%. In August, is now 38%. In other words, a majority still support the protesters, but the support has fallen by about 10% since June. So what can you, what, what do you read from that? Because obviously protesters, the peaceful ones who you mentioned and that the world has seen, are being conflated with some who have come to do harm and who have rioted and who have killed now and who have burnt down property. Yes, but these incidents directed at African Americans keep happening over and over and over again. So the conversation gets renewed. I believe that since George Floyd, since that day, uh, the conversation nationwide has in fact been elevated I think that the conscience of white America has been elevated about black lives mattering. Uh, the polls will ebb and flow, but we continue to have these incidents to the point where, yet again, it's front page news and it's uppermost, it's the top of the hour on shows like this. So I believe that in this country, at least, there is a new awareness of the grievance that is being discussed on a weekly and, and daily basis. The polls may ebb and flow, uh, and then uh, the current administration seems to want to play the law and order card with this. But the grievance is real, and it continues in a, in a national dialogue, in my observation. Uh, can I finally ask you about, again, politicization of certain issues? You've inferred that you know there's a lot of <clears throat> politics being played around, uh, around this right now with, the, you know, with yep. what's going on. Uh, and also, as you have seen over the convention, the president has used the White House um, for various, obviously, political partisan events. It's his, it's his re-election campaign, and he's used that. I want to know, as a former cabinet secretary, and obviously, you know, the former secretary of Homeland Security, what you think of, of Secretary of State Pompeo breaking tradition, being the first secretary of state to address a convention, and, and that from abroad, from Jerusalem. And uh, what about one of your successors, acting uh, secretary, Chad Wolf, using the White House to stage a naturalization ceremony uh, for the president, um, o o you know, last night? There is some limited space to allow a cabinet officer in his personal capacity to participate in politics, emphasis on his, in his personal capacity. It is difficult to see how the secretary of state on an official foreign trip can segregate that out and claim to be acting in his personal capacity when he gave that speech from, from Israel last night. Likewise, I do not see, as a former Secretary of Homeland Security, 
how I could participate in an event in my official capacity as Secretary of Homeland Security uh, filmed for something I know is going to be a political convention. Frankly, I went to the other extreme uh, because I believe that Homeland Security needs to be completely apolitical. Uh, I went to actually both conventions four years ago because I was responsible for the security of both conventions. And so a week before they took place, I actually visited both sites, but I made sure that I was mm -hmm. going to both the Democratic and Republican convention sites because DHS has the responsibility for the security of those sites. And we, we should do that in an even-handed way. Homeland security is something mm -hmm. that has to be above politics. This is so interesting to, to remind us of that. Thank you so much for joining us, Secretary Jay Johnson. And now, the ravages of nature are also framing this Republican National Convention. In California, raging wildfires have burned over a million acres and at least seven people have been killed. At the same time, Hurricane Laura is barreling towards Texas and Louisiana, forcing residents to evacuate. Scientists say there is no doubt that climate change is driving extreme weather. And yet, for the second time in a row, the Republican National Convention will have nothing to say about it. Environmentalist and Republican Benji Backer grew up knocking on doors for John McCain and Mitt Romney. In college, he created the American Conservation Coalition, aimed at engaging young people on climate change. And he's joining me now from Billings, Montana. Benji Backer, welcome to the program. Can I ask it's you then for your, for your, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have you to talk about this actually, because, um, you know, it's a really important subject. And I just wondered what you thought about the convention, again, not having it on the platform at all. Yeah, well, honestly, it is a very frustrating moment for a lot of young people across the country who are looking for both sides to engage on climate. Young people don't see climate in terms of Republican or Democrat. Uh, they see it in terms of climate. And to have only one side at the table is really damaging for not only the environment, but the conservative uh, movement and the Republican Party as well. 77% of young conservatives, according to our polling and other polling, uh, want action on climate. And that includes our members across the country. We have thousands of them across the country who want this sort of action. And for two presidential conventions in a row to not engage on climate. It's an immense failure uh, of the Republican Party. But it's also too bad because there has been a lot of action within the Republican Party on climate over the past four years. In fact, the most climate-friendly governors in the United States uh, are, are Governor Baker, Governor Hogan, and Governor Sununu, all Republicans. And Republicans have been putting together climate plans. Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, uh, put together a climate plan. Senator Braun and, and Congressman John Curtis have been stewards of, of the environment and putting together tons of climate policies. But unfortunately, the National Party is not reflecting not only the youth voters, but also the immense progress that has been made within the party itself. Well, it's really interesting to hear you, uh, you know, raise this to that level, and especially the 77% number is very high. And last week you tweeted, conservatism without a climate plan is a conservatism that will never last. What do you mean by that? Well, in all honesty, it's the truth. Conservatism will not last if climate policy isn't at the forefront of these issues. Young people are wanting climate action more than ever. And like I said earlier, climate is not perceived as a partisan issue to young people. They don't want it to be partisan. And so if you have one side that is perceived as the climate party and one side that is perceived as the climate denial party, even though that's not true, you are not going to be able to recruit and, and get young voters on your side as the climate denial party. And so the conservative movement is once again delaying four more years of progress with young people who oftentimes have fiscally conservative values. They want to be economically and fiscally responsible and they want, but they at the same time, they want action on climate. They want pragmatic action. They don't want the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. But if the Green New Deal and, and, the, and the Democratic Party is all they're hearing from on climate, then they will never vote for Republicans or free market ideals or limited government ideals, which I have fought my entire life for. So somebody who has fought their entire life for conservative ideals, 
I know firsthand, knowing other thousands of young conservatives across the country and young moderates, that this is an issue that is going to make or break how they associate politically going forward. So, you know, again, uh, how, so how do you mobilize um, the people who you seem to be saying are standing in the, in the way of serious climate policies in your party? Uh, and let's just say that, you know, you belong to a party that says, uh, you know, climate change is not oppressing national security. It's, 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 a, it's the triumph of extremism over common sense. Um, how do you make your young voices heard, given that young people are such a powerful um, voting bloc, particularly this cycle? How can you, in your party, you know, ramp this up to the top of the agenda? Well, for the past three years, the American Conservation Coalition has been building a grassroots base of young people who want market-based solutions, pragmatic solutions to environmental challenges, and we've mobilized them during in-person fly-ins, when, when we could fly people into DC and have meetings, we were doing tons of virtual events and, and meeting with elected officials to push them to do more on climate. Uh, we're obviously being very active on social media. In fact, this week, we launched a campaign called hashtag what about climate, where we've already had over 2 million people engage with us about why the conservative movement should and the Republican Party should have a platform on climate. Our voices are working, our, our numbers are growing, our base is growing. Uh, uh, and it is really actually exciting, and I, and I have a lot of hope outside of this convention. I have a lot of hope uh, about where the party can go in the future because there is a lot of progress being made. And unfortunately, the national party is not reflective of where the average activist or voter is, but it's also not reflective of where the elected officials are and how far people like Kevin McCarthy and Elise Stefanik and these members of Congress in the United States on the Republican side have come on these issues. There have been some incredible, there's been incredible leadership on this side and the Republican Party can be the party of climate and we're pushing for the Republican Party to be the party of climate. And at the same time, the National Party has not been responsive, while a lot of others have been. And so young people and the environment at large are waiting for the Republican Party at the national level to, to engage. So I hear what you're saying um, from a young person's perspective, and you mentioned some of those uh, officials, and yet they have sort of stood by as, as the administration, the Trump administration over the last three years, has systematically dismantled a lot of the environmental protections, a lot of the EPA um, protections. And now, of course, we hear about, um, you know, opening up the Arctic Wildlife Refuge for oil drilling. Would you prefer not to, for that not to happen? I mean, are you the kind of climate activist who would rather see regulations in place for clean air, you know, clean water, all the things that are being rolled back, including limits on methane, which is a terrible, uh, you know, climate danger? Yeah, I mean, you're seeing firsthand right now the effects of climate change in California and the hurricanes, and it's on top, it's on the top of people's minds. And so when you have these terrible situations happening nationwide, uh, and then you, and then it's not backed up through policies from the top down in the, in the United States government, that is really frustrating. Uh, as, as a young conservative climate activist, I think there's an important balance between regulation and, and the marketplace and kind of how we can pair small, uh, small scale solutions and, and market based solutions with common sense regulation that doesn't necessarily always harm the economy. And I think if, if the president wants to reduce regulations that are not necessary for improving the environment, he has to have a plan as to, OK, so if this regulation wasn't working, then what? Instead of just rolling things back, have his own plan. And so as an organization, these things are not as simple. We know that these things are not as simple as regulation good or, or regulation bad or market-based mechanism good or market-based mechanism bad. It's more convoluted than that, and people need to understand that. But at the same time, if you're only rolling things back and attacking one side for their climate policies when you don't have your own, that doesn't send a good message and it doesn't help the climate conversation. We don't have time to wait for mm -hmm. one side to be table and the other side to not be at the table. And honestly, uh, younger generations are, are pushing that more than ever before. And you're going to see that reflected in how they vote this November. OK, so again, that's really in interesting. How are you going to vote this November? Are you going to vote for your president? 
Well, that's a really great question. And, and for me personally, I've been really focused on trying to to elect those conservatives in the House and the Senate. Uh, we released some endorsements uh, last week for the Republicans that have been at the forefront of climate action. And so as an organization in my personal capacity, uh, we're really focused on keeping conservatives who are good on these issues engaged. Uh, people like Congressman John Curtis, who I'll be joining on a, a live stream talking about this very issue during the RNC tonight. Um, on Facebook. And, and and it's people like that that we need to keep in the House and the Senate. So personally, I believe for climate action to, to, to actually happen, we need action from Congress, state legislators, and businesses. And then, of course, on the globe, we need the globe to act as well. I'm not as worried about the president as a lot of people are because the action comes from other sources and that and that's where we have to prioritize our time. So I believe that as consumers we have a huge role in in using our dollars for voting power. I believe that uh, our state house uh, and senate members and our and our federal house and senate members are the key to unlocking the right policies on these things and we focus far too much on the presidency when the action comes from other places. So I have not decided where I'm going to be in the presidential election at this point, but my focus right now and our focus at ACC is on those races that will actually make a difference on climate change. And I would urge people who care about climate change globally and here in the United States to focus on what types of people are getting elected who are going to make those decisions and also what companies are doing and how we can push both forward into a cleaner, better future. And, and on your side, uh, presumably, are great stats which show that, you know, the green economy has generated more than $1.3 trillion in annual revenue, uh, which is a big part of the U.S. GDP. Green economy has grown by over 20 percent um, over the last several years. So these are great stats that you can, you can, you can take with you to, uh, to, the, to, the, to your officials. Benji Backer, thank you very much indeed. Now, the coronavirus pandemic is another leadership litmus test. South Africa, one of the continent's biggest economies, tackled it head on with a strict lockdown. President Ramaphosa also imposed prohibition to stave off endemic domestic abuse in the country. But alcohol is now back on sale, back on the shelves, and women are now back suffering an eruption of violence against them. Our next guest, Joshina Michelle, is a survivor after her partner leveled a brutal attack five years ago that blinded her in one eye. She has set up the Kaluka movement that empowers women like her. She is also Grassa Michelle's daughter and thus Nelson Mandela's stepdaughter, proving that this violence knows no boundaries and no privileges. She joins me now from Johannesburg. Joshina Michelle, welcome to the program. Um, let's, let's just talk about what's happening in South Africa at the moment and particularly the spike in coronavirus, at least the time of lockdown, how that has, has really led to a spike in domestic violence. Tell me what you're seeing there. Christian, um, the truth is that uh, domestic violence has spiked indeed, or we've got more cases being recorded during this period. But um, as you know, South Africa has already horrendous numbers of women reporting gender-based violence through rape, beating, and the highest level, the highest level of femicide in, in, in the world. So what corona has done is really driven the concentration, the attention of people in general to realize the horrors of gender-based violence. But it is not a problem that has come solely uh, because of gender-based violence. And it is something that we still have to deal with adequately in the future. Um, Joshina, I mentioned um, a little bit about your own traumatic experience. Um, tell us what happened to you and what was the result in terms of accountability, law enforcement, the courts? I was brutally attacked uh, by my then partner, Rufinu Likuku, in, on the October 17th, 2015. I received two blows, uh, one to the middle of my face, one to my right eye, which blinded me immediately, and a third one to the back of my head. At that point, I ran away from the car, and eventually he did pick me up and took me to the hospital. 
Um, at the hospital, I endured what it's called second victimization, where the treatment that was um, given to me was extremely poor. Later on, we discovered that my files, my 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 files in the hospitals, my file in the in the police had disappeared. By the time we actually got to court, uh, something like 18 months later, myself and my lawyer and the team had already resorted to making three to five copies of each document before we actually presented in order to ensure that it never disappeared. Um, and so eventually we did get the verdict of guilt. He was found guilty. Um, and unfortunately, a few weeks ago, a higher court of appeal has absolved him of the crime of gender-based violence. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the horrible postscript to all of this. Um, and, and is that the norm in, I mean, this happened in, in Mozambique, the country of your birth, but you're also, uh, you know, the, the stepdaughter of the, of the great liberation leader of, um, of South Africa as well, and it's happening there. W what is the accountability level? Do most people have your experience in terms of trying to get justice? Unfortunately, I have to report that millions of women in this part of the world, in the African continent in particular, experience this kind of treatment by the authorities that are meant to protect them. It is not new to hear that files of victims have, have vanished. It is not new to hear that women who have gathered all the evidence and everything is in place to ensure that perpetrators of violence are held accountable. Um, unfortunately, it is not new to hear that the cases go actually against it. And the judiciary authorities still allow um, violence to go unpunished and for perpetrators to not be accountable. Um, I, I want to play something that the president of South Africa uh, said. He, he, he had a nationally televised address in June when, when this was becoming very, very evident in South Africa. This is what he said to the women of South Africa. As a man, as a husband, and as a father to daughters, I am appalled at what is no less than a war that is being waged against the women and the children of our country. By looking away, by discouraging victims from laying charges, by shaming and insulting women for their lifestyle choices or their style of dress, we become complicit in these crimes. Joshina, that is a pretty big statement for a president to make. I mean, he really does seem to be like, he gets it, he's, he's on your side. Last year, he signed some $75 million to fighting gender-based violence. And um, he's asking lawmakers to process amendments, including minimum sentencing, stiffer bail conditions for perpetrators. Is that working? Is it showing results? We have to congratulate Pre President Ramaphosa for actually having uh, put in place all these measures and ensuring that his government actually takes the issue of gender-based violence as an emergency. However, GBV in this country is really a war against women. Millions, thousands of women wake up every day as if they were soldiers. We never know how many of us will be beaten, how many will be raped, how many would be killed. As we're talking right now in the few minutes, our statistics demonstrate that at least three women have already been raped while we were having this conversation. Now, we have to congratulate the government for all the, the legislation that is putting in place. But the issue with gender-based violence goes along the way of having the legislation, but ensuring that such legislation is actually applied. So there is effort in the country at this point to ensure that at the level of the judiciaries, at the level of the police, they are trained people to handle this issue. However, the numbers are horrendous. 
It's every day. It's families. It's women that are getting ripped apart. And of course, nothing that is done still justifies. And, of, and we also have a very low level of prosecution when it comes to abusers of gender, to abusers. And so it does not really um, respond or it does not make sense to ask for women to step out, to come and talk about the experience if then the perpetrators mm -hmm. are not punished mm -hmm. and made accountable. Well, also, you, you believe that men should speak out too. And one of the major male figures are in South Africa, the captain of the Springbok national rugby uh, team, has spoken up. He says uh, he's done so because he witnessed his mother and his aunt being abused when he was a child. This is what he said recently. I will read it for you. I remember when I was younger, the first thing I was taught was how to use a condom not how to treat a lady or how to be a better man. I mean, that's pretty, it's a pretty big admission, a pretty sensitive thing to say. And it is a reality of many men in this continent. Um, they are not, men are not t uh, taught how to treat women with respect and to value them. As a result, um, we see the horrible numbers that show every day in terms of rape, in terms of abuse, and disregard. Above that is the disregard for women's lives. And then, of course, it's from the lower level, it's from the family level that goes to the societal level, to institutions that then manifest the kind of sentences that we as African women are now fighting again and demanding that there is justice for each one of us that goes and reports gender-based violence. And Joshina, I'm sure for your, your global community of women as well, because, you know, it's happening here in the UK, Brazil, France, Mexico, the US have seen spikes. And according to the UN, literally hundreds of millions of girls and women uh, last year alone were attacked by their partners. Joshina Michelle, thank you so much indeed for joining us. And now, Back to the big story of the week, which is the Republican convention and the case for President Trump and four more years. Mia Love broke a glass ceiling in 2015 when she became the first black Republican congresswoman. The daughter of Haitian immigrants and a Mormon convert, Mia Love represented Utah's 4th District until she lost her seat back in 2019, last year. Love is a proud conservative. Indeed, she spoke at the 2012 Republican convention, but today the question of whether she ports she supports her party's president is not an easy one for her to answer. And here she is explaining why to our Michelle Martin. Thanks, Christian. Mia Love, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to speak to you. Uh, I'm happy to speak to you too. Um, I, I do want to talk about the conventions, both conventions, but I wanted to kind of go back big picture before yeah. that. And I wanted to ask you, Looking back at the last three years, what do you think the Trump administration has done well, if anything? And what do you think the Trump administration has done poorly, if anything? Well, let, let's talk about the negatives, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mentioned in my concession speech that it seems to me that the administration is incredibly transactional. And as if you saw in the, um, the convention last night, all of the people that we're speaking have been people that have been supportive from day one. He has this mentality that you're either all in with me or you're all out. And for some Republicans, that has been difficult because there are principles and platforms that we believe in. And when you uh, leave those platforms or you um, divert away from those platforms, mm -hmm. It, we, as a member of Congress and even as a Republican or a citizen, it is your duty and responsibility to say, wait a minute, that's not what we believe in. And I remember in part you said in 2016, part of the reason that you didn't go to the Republican convention is that you, you were representing your constituents who were still that's ambivalent. Right. And, and, and so it, was, it, it doesn't mean, I mean, you can't take those things personally. And I think the administration does take some of those things personally. Also, I don't think there is really an American that, that agrees 100% with the president's Twitter feed and the language that he uses. Um, it could be incredibly divisive. Uh, the only people that I think probably are okay with that are the ones that are 
really on the fringe and really, I mean, they're, they're just fed up and they will go with him at all costs and justify anything that he says. So my issue with the president has been mainly a personality issue. So let's talk about what he's done correctly. I think that foreign policy, um, the tough, uh, the tough mentality with Kim Jong-un in North Korea, with um, terrorist groups, with even um, Putin, in terms of um, trying to say, look, you're not going to mess with the United States, that brash um, bulldog has been, has been good for us. Um, I think that the, the actions that he's taken in, um, in making sure that he, he took out terrorists uh, has been good for us. I also think that the economy pre-COVID was doing really well for all Americans. In the state of Utah, we had less than 2% unemployment and dropping. And so that raised wages and people were doing well. Black communities were doing better. Criminal justice reform has been a great thing for the administration. Um, funding HBCUs permanently has been a great thing for the administration. Um, I worked on tax reform. Uh, signing some of these bills into law has been really good. So policy-wise, I think that we, in the economy as a whole, was doing really well. And so when he actually says, if you want the economy to come to go back to pre-COVID, I'm the one that can do it because I've done it before. Those are the policies. Are you going to vote for him? I have not made that decision. I actually think um, that it's important for me to continue to give myself as much time as possible before I commit because you never know what's going to end up happening. Um, but I do, I can tell you this, um, for the policies that I know of with um, Joe Biden and what he, what he believes in, um, I, I, I will not be voting for Joe Biden. I'm not going to be one of the Republicans that supports Joe just because of my um, issues with the president. So you've given us a lot to think about. Um, briefly, I, I don't want to spend too much time on tone because, you know, the conventions are television shows. They've been television shows for years. Give me your take on what the Democrats presented and then give me your take on what the Republicans have presented so far. Tone, because you, you raised tone as part of your right. issue with the way the president's conducted himself I, in office. And you know what? It is. It, it, it is about tone. Because I think that Americans are just tired of the doom and gloom. I believe they're tired. People are tired. They're, they've been stuck at home. They've, they've had to deal with um, a health crisis and then had to deal with not some losing so much work, um, not being able to feed. It, it's just too much doom and gloom. I think the Democrats lost an opportunity to talk about some of the positives and to talk about what they're going to do to help the country get back. Um, a lot of the uh, the speeches were recorded um, several, some some of them two weeks in advance, and I think it lost the opportunity to really address or to flow freely on some of the issues that were present. Um, so I think that that was missing. I was pleasantly surprised. I was keeping my fingers crossed, hoping that we wouldn't talk about um, the the president as much as we would talk about the American people. I think that people like. Senator Tim Scott was phenomenal because he talked about the American dream. His tone was about, I mean, it, it was about from cotton to Congress and how that was, his, that was the American dream that was achieved. His grandfather that couldn't even read um, now has a, had a grandson, was able to see a grandson um, become a, a member of Congress. Um, it, it spoke to me because my parents immigrated from Haiti and they had nothing, $10 in their pockets and saw their daughter become the first black female Republican in Congress. That was their American dream. It had nothing to do with health, uh, with, with wealth. It had everything to do with an ideal that you can, through hard work and education, be something way beyond what you, what you envisioned for yourself and for your children. Both nominees have said in one way or another, don't just talk, watch what I say, watch what I do. And I think right. a lot of the Democrats felt that their presentation was its own message of optimism. The diversity, the going around the country, the display of different kinds of people, all different kinds of people, and the roll call showing people all over the country, the calamari, that that was its own message. And as a champion of diversity in your own party, you didn't right. see that? Oh, yeah. In terms of the, no, okay. uh, no, I saw, I saw some of it, but I think it was, there was a lot of, this is how the president has hurt America. 
And I didn't see very much as a person that's looking for solutions. I didn't see very much of those of what are the policies that are going to change. All I kept saying is all I kept seeing is this has to change. This is what the president has done. I'm aware of the negative effects of the administration as a Republican. I'm aware. But what are you going to do to really change it? What are the policies? And I, I, I just don't have any any solid policies. Whereas when I'm looking at Tim Scott, who, who is a good friend, full disclosure, a very good friend of mine, but I saw him work on, on um, police reform policies. And he even stated, which I think is going to resonate with Americans, is that they would rather have the issue than the solution. So let's talk about the policy. Let's sort of talk about the substance. I mean, you've identified a couple of, fact, of, of areas similar to what many of the convention speakers identified as what you consider to be areas of accomplishment. Let's talk about the president, President Trump. In the first three years, he brought about or what's, what occurred under his administration, slightly less empo employment growth than his predecessor did, the same gross domestic product growth, slightly better stock market growth, the same wage growth. This is all pre-pandemic. And now, of course, we see that we have record record unemployment, the, the, the worst unemployment since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Is that really a record of accomplishment? Actually, a better economy, more people finding jobs. And look, I'm not, this is, I'm not a an apologist for the president. I have not been. Um, but that's an area where he actually has done well. I've seen it in our state. I've seen it across the country. That was one area that no matter where, what we talked about, um, that was one area that we kept saying, you need to focus on that. And even Democrats kept saying, if he focused on that instead of the language that he was using, he would actually do a little bit better. Um, so that is an area that I, th I do think, yes, that he has done well. Um, slightly better is better than a decline. And I think it was a little bit more than slightly better. Um, I, we saw it in our, in like our state, we saw the, uh, the, the economy growing. We saw the projections. Um, and it, it's, people were bringing home a little bit more, were making a little bit more, were able to get more jobs. And that's always a good thing. And in the foreign policy realm, no concessions from North Korea. Yes, it's true that he's reimposed sanctions. He's reimposed sanctions on Iran. No concessions from North Korea. Met with a North Korean dictator without any prior concessions at all, something no previous president has done, has achieved no concessions since those meetings, and says that he and he and the North Korean dictator fell in love, has yet to confront the president of Russia about bounties leveled on troops in Afghanistan. And and I'll and I'll also add to that that 70, at least 70 Republican national security officials released a letter saying that the country is now less safe than it was before he took office. What's your take on that? Well, I don't know if we are less safe, and I'm not going to agree with everything that the president has done when it comes to foreign policy. I don't agree with the love fest, but there are there are the, the previous administration in terms of crossing lines. I was there in Congress when the Iran deal was set that was done without Congress at all. That was done. Um, that was giving Iran about a fourth of its GDP back to them without having any um, concessions on stopping the terrorist attacks. Um, I was there uh, watching that, and that was really. I think that that was incredibly harmful. Um, so I think that when we're talking about some of these, some of these things, um, talking about North Korea and making sure that we denuclearize um, North Korea, that's important. Um, I don't agree with uh, some of the things in terms of um, uh, removing ourselves. We've become a little bit more isolationist instead of being a little bit more engaged and involved. I don't agree with that. Did he show you any inclination of being willing to reach out beyond the people who have already supported him all these years? Has he given you any indication of any willingness to do that, even within the Republican Party? Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean again, this is this this is the precedent that has, that I mentioned earlier. You're either all in with him or you're all out, and I think that that's that's a detriment because when you are the leader of the nation, you your much. job is not just to re to represent Thank your you. followers, not just to represent Republicans, but to represent Americans.
And, and where does that leave somebody like you? And where does that leave somebody like uh, former, you know, General Jim Mattis or or the former Secretary of State or the former heads of all these other Republican people who tried to, Republican national security officials distinguished in their fields, many of them with distinguished careers, someone like yourself, a rising star who had in the party a groundbreaker, a glass ceiling breaker, and yet because of points of difference on policy issues, legitimate points of difference, find yourself without party. Where does that leave you? Here's where it leads me. As a daughter of parents who immigrated and who worked hard, who are legitimately Americans also, it leads me to saying, I am not going to put all my eggs in that basket, that I'm not going to follow a person blindly, that I'm going to stick with my principles and my beliefs, and I'm going to continue to say things the way that I believe, the, the, the things that I believe in. I'm not going to follow at all costs just because the person says that they're a Republican and they are the president of the United States. I have always maintained that when I was a member of Congress, it was not my job to follow behind him, but it was his job to follow behind us mm -hmm. because us, the American people, that's what it means to be government for the people, by the people, is that you are not, being a leader is not just saying all of my decisions are correct, but it is representing the people that put you in office. And so wanna, where, that leads, where, that yeah, leads where does that leave you? Yeah. That, with not pulling away from the things that I believe in. What that leaves me is being honest as, an, as, as a mother and as a wife and as an American to continue to say, these are the things I agree with. These are the things I disagree with. And if you don't like me, then that's your business. But it is, I put you there. It is, you are to represent me. You are not my boss. I am yours. Can I get a reaction to something that Nikki Haley, the former UN ambassador, former South Carolina governor, person, of, woman of color herself, uh, said in her remarks to the convention, she said, in much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. What's your reaction? My reaction to that is... The more we talk about it, I, I thought I, I, I prefer to have the Tim Scott approach to it. I understand what she is saying. And I think that what she probably should have said is maybe we're not where we were in the 1800s. Maybe we were not where we were in the 1900s. There are some things that we can do better. And so that would be my reaction to that. You can't completely ignore some of the things that we have to work on. As we've noted, you were a, a glass breaker. Uh, you were the first. African American, black, black Republican woman elected to the Congress. Kamala Harris is the first black woman, the first woman of color on a major party ticket. Mm -hmm. And she's been, I, I don't know how other way to say it, the conservative media has conducted an assault on her. I mean, they have directed a sexual uh, smear campaign at her. I mean, they have questioned her right to run a, a birth a so-called another birther uh, attack claiming that she is uh, some obscure legal theory from the 19th century claiming that she's not qualified right she was born in the united states of course she's qualified right i, I just wonder I even though you're not of the same party does her ascension to the ticket mean anything to you and do the assaults on her mean anything to you of course of course it does because i i witnessed some of that um mm -hmm. You know, being a black woman in America is is difficult as as it is, and I remember a lot of uh, assaults against me, um, and it was from actually from both. And you know, we always have to work harder to prove ourselves when we're articulate. It's really interesting. It's like we always get, hmm, that person's really articulate. It, 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 you're like, well, I, I, I'm an educated American. I, uh, you know, it, somebody, no one gave this to me. No one gave this, you know, you earn your way through. And so I think that, you know, of, of course I feel it because I think that, um, you know, I, I, I witnessed that myself. And here's what I always say, attack, attack the policies, attack the politics, not the person. Do you have any so, advice for her? I would say to continue to just rise above it and, and push forth your policies. You know, I think that there, I think it would, 
it would be better for her if she if they got away from this is what's bad and and go towards these are my solutions this is my policy this is how i'm going to fix things and ignore it um and just and and you know one of the things that i i agree with actually michelle obama about is go high rise above it and you know it's really again really interesting is when i first met michelle obama she said i want you to know that i'm happy you're here um set, set the standard high set the standard high and so i would say for all women all women of color um and for everyone is to set the standard high because we as americans deserve better we deserve better Mia Love, thank you so much for talking with us thank you so much i appreciate it it was fun and we should all set our personal and professional standards high that is it for now you can always follow us online and all over our social media. See you again tomorrow night.